It wasn't like a great plan. Um, we've we've never been uh, avoiding a follow-up to the Def Leppard album. It's just that we've been touring non-stop until the pandemic, and we were due out that year. Um, but we we'd made a, a decision at the end of the the last tour, which finished in Nashville, November 2019. We made a game plan to get together in, in my studio in Dublin early 2020, which re the realis realistically that became March of 2020, just to see what we had so we could make a start on writing some new music. Knowing full well that we were going out on the stadium tour in June, those rehearsals would start in May and they were coming to my place on the 22nd of, of March. So it was essentially by the time everybody got up a jet lag and we got going, it was going to be the month of April. We were never going to get an album finished. We were just going to get something started that we could carry on after the tour finished. And then the day that they were all due to fly in, um, lockdown, boom. Nobody's allowed to travel, there's no flights, everybody's in isolation. So I got on the phone with Phil and said, okay, um, seeing as now we don't have an opportunity to look each other in the eye and say, okay, who's got what, you know, new song wise. I said to Phil, I said, what do you think we should do? And he said, well, let's see what we can do remotely. You know, we've dabbled with remote recording in the past. On previous albums, we may have all been recording at my place and then everybody's had to go home and we're missing a solo here or we're missing a, a backing vocal there. And they've all said, it's not a problem. I'll do it at home and just email it over. So we've dabbled. We've done this for decades where we've finished bits off from other places. So we were inexperienced at doing an entire album remotely, but we'd done remote recording. And it's the same principle um, as when we're all in the same building, because we don't necessarily record everything all at once. We'll put down the basic track and then there's you know, a plethora of guitar overdubs and backing vocals and lead vocals. And so it was not really vastly different to how we would normally do it, except we were in three different countries, you know. Um, and so in this initial 40 minute phone call with Phil, we just got this vibe that it's like, okay, we're starting from scratch, we're going remote. It's, it's relatively exciting to be able to stay at home for a few weeks longer because we're always out on the road, so we're never really at home for a long time. And we said, okay, let's pour everything we have onto this metaphorical table and see what we have, you know. And I said to Phil, how many songs you got? And he said, well, I've written one with a friend of mine called Sam Hollander, um, which was the song Fire It Up. I've written, he'd written two others, which was uh, this, uh, sorry, um, Liquid Dust and You Rock Me. I begged him to put this guitar on the table. He wrote that song in 2003 and I've always wanted to sing it. It just been sitting around gathering cobwebs, you know. So he basically had four at the time. I had three, two of which I'd written on the piano and one that of his had written on the ukulele. So we were really open-minded as to like what direction this is gonna go in. And we instantly realized that for this amount of time we're going to be in lockdown, which at the time we had no idea how long that was going to be, we had seven songs to be getting on with remotely to see how they work because we sent each other the demos and we liked the songs, so there was nothing to change except just record them. And then the lockdown kept getting moved and it kept getting extended. And now we're into April and we're into May, and as soon as we get into May, we know the tour is postponed. So now we're totally open-ended to record. And this is when we started writing new material. So me and Sav, sorry, me and Phil, we wrote five songs. Me and Sav wrote one, Sav wrote one on his own. So we had 14 songs to be getting on with. Um, and we just kept going. We just kept recording and recording and recording. Um, and the way it worked was everybody was recording whatever they wanted to the songs at home and sending them to Ronan McHugh, our producer engineer who was gluing it all together in this fantastic Pro Tools session that he'd uh, put together. So essentially, as he said to us, guys, this is actually quite easy. It's exactly the same principle as if we were all in the same building. It's just that you, instead of walking into the room to record, you're sending me over performances that you've done at home because everybody's got their own studios. So we've got all the sounds dialed in. So it, it was the most fun 
album we've ever made. Absolutely, you know, you, you're looking at the pandemic and you're going, this is awful. There's people dying. There's people cannot go and see their relatives in, in old folks' homes. They can't go to hospital to visit their relatives. They're either sick or they're dying. And you're realizing that this is a deadly serious situation that the whole world seems to be, you know, dealing with. What is our contribution to making this thing survivable? Our contribution is to stay safe. We're not doctors, we're not nurses, we're not scientists, we're musicians. So what could we do? What we could do is stay isolated and stay focused on what we decided to do, which was not let however much time it was, which ended up being about two years, not letting that time go to waste. So we've been working relentlessly on thousands of different things, back catalog stuff, future releases, current releases, um, merchandise, I mean, everything, you know. Um, we just kept ourselves, in fact, I was more busy during lockdown than I was before. So it, it was a fantastic way to stay focused. And other than, you know, putting on the hazmat suit once a week to go and do the weekly shop, uh, we, we all literally stayed in our own environments. You know, I could go into the garden. Phil used to go in Laguna, he'd go down to the beach because it was isolated down there. Um, we, we just lived our lives as family people. We, we had more time with the family, yet we could still make this amazing record, which we didn't have to work on seven days a week. And we weren't all waiting around for one of us to finish their part so we could do ours. Essentially, at any given time, anybody in the band could be working on whichever song they wanted, and it all got sent to Ronan to glue together. So it was a, it was a joy. I tell you this much, I don't think we will ever make a traditional album ever again in the sense of all turning up in the one room because this was way more it was it was way more fun it was way more focused and it was so um freeing of all barriers you know we were doing songs on the piano we were bringing and bringing in mike garson from david bowie's band to play the piano alison Krauss sings on two songs and like i said you know we're using the piano more than we've ever used it in the past phil wrote um liquid dust on, on sorry you rock me on um on a ukulele you know to start it off with at least so there was so much enthusiasm and giddiness within the band like this is great how much fun is this you know phil would say to me yeah, i was down on the beach at six o'clock this morning went for a swim came home opened my email from me to the demo I'd, or what i'd sent him to work on and while i'm asleep he's working on it because we had an eight hour time difference which worked in our favor it was an amazing experience, it really was. I don't think we know what that secret is. I think we're forever looking for the holy grail. You know, the X factor is essentially an invisible force that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. I mean, for example, take whichever song you think is the most iconic, important or popular Def Leppard song there is. And then imagine every other song we've ever done, we've put exactly the same amount of effort, work, work ethic, and, and um, kind of heart and soul into every song we've ever done. But some of them catch and some of them don't. If you knew what it was, then you're into the ultimate formula. And we don't really want to work in formulas, which is why this record was so much fun to do, if you like, because we indulged ourselves in a way that we've never done before, yet it's not actually self-indulgent. All it was is if Phil said, I've got a song I've written on a ukulele, none of us went, well, you can't do that. And if I said, well, I've written a couple of songs on the piano, nobody went, well, you can't do that. They said, okay, let's hear the songs. And as soon as everybody heard these songs, they went, that's a Def Leppard song. There's no problem with that. It's changing how you work things. I mean, even Iron Maiden used the piano on their last album. It's not like an, an evil instrument, and neither is Melody, and neither is bringing in Alison Krauss, who is the most gorgeous bluegrass country singer that you'll ever hear, and, but a big Def Leppard fan, which is, you know, which was a, a lovely thing to get her involved. And again, it was organic. We didn't go hunting her down. 
I was talking to Robert Plant about soccer, and he just said, "What are you up to?" And I said, "We, well, you know, shh, don't tell anybody, but we're making a new record." And he was, I think, he was just finishing with Alison on the second album, and I, you know, he said, "Well, I'm going to have to tell Alison because you're her favourite band," you know. <laughs> and then our manager, accidentally or coincidentally, bumped into her manager, and they were speaking about it. And then word got back to Alison, and we were like, if she wants to sing on the album, she's welcome. And she was like, yeah, I'd love to. So we had those two songs. We didn't know which one we, we she'd like the, the best. So we sent them both. And she texted me back within about an hour saying, I can't pick. I, I, the, the, I love them both. So I just texted her back, well, you can do them both then if you want. And she did. So, you know, keeping it fresh is bringing in Mike Garson on the piano, bringing in Alison Krauss, writing remotely. And, and, and taking our time to make sure that it was all good. You know, we, we didn't have to rush it. We didn't have a record deal when we started this album. We didn't have a delivery date. So we were just recording as artists for fun. There was no end game to worry about. Well, we've got to get it done for now. That came literally right at the very end when we had the 14 songs we recorded. And Phil phoned me up one day and he says, I've just written a song with Dave Bassett, who was this songwriter guy in, in, LA, in LA. And he says, I think you should hear it. So I, <laughs> he sent me an MP3, like five minutes later, I'm listening to it. And I'm texting him back going, you've got to be kidding me. We've got to do this. So all of a sudden we have this 15th song and this is how exciting it was. And as soon as we had that song done and we by then got a record deal in place, we literally had to finish it pretty quick because because of vinyl, there's like an eight month delay on getting vinyl pressed. And if we wanted this album out, we needed to get the album delivered as soon as we could. So we got this song finished, uh, the standard that we wanted it finished to. And that was Kick, which is the first song that we've released off the album. So it shows you how important a last song can be because this happened to us on the Hysteria album. The last song written for Hysteria was Pour Some Sugar On Me, which is arguably the most important song on that album, if not our entire career so far. So, you know, keeping it fresh is, it was just, it was just natural. It was an obvious thing with this record because it was so different. It couldn't help but be fresh. We'd never worked like this before. Yes, I could. Uh, I can't give you a specific date or dates, but we are bringing this tour, uh, God willing, to Europe in 2023. Got plenty of them. They're not always good. Some of them are pretty grim. Like uh, 1981, we were opening for Richie Blackmore's Rainbow and we literally flew in the day after we finished recording the High and Dry album. So we hadn't had a chance to rehearse. And I do believe that first gig was in Essen. We literally walked on stage, no sound check, and we hadn't played a gig in over a year. So you can imagine it was, it was a disaster. And um, I know that the reviews were awful. I couldn't read them because they were in German, but everybody was telling me, what's the review saying? They're all going, you really don't want to know. <laughs> um, looking at that's now 41 years ago, and it's a, it's a distant memory that's become a bit of an anecdote within the band. But um, you got to look at the Monsters of Rock shows in, in 1986. Um, which were recorded in the middle of the Hysteria album. You know, we needed a break. We were getting what we like to call cabin fever. We'd been in the studio for two years and we were nowhere near finished. And this opportunity to, to play four shows, one in Sweden, one in England and two in Germany, um, with the Scorpions, Ozzy Osbourne. You know, I mean, it was, it was a great bunch of bands. I think maybe Accept were on the bill. I can't remember actually. And the, there's a photograph in the middle, in the inner sleeve of the Hysteria album of Death Lover on stage in Germany. And it had been raining all the way through our set. So all the equipment is covered in plastic. So of course the sound can't really penetrate the plastic. So it doesn't sound great. Everybody's drenched. And then right at the end of the set for the encore, the sun came out and the rain stopped. And Ross Alfin took this great photograph of Steve Clark and Phil in kilts messing about on stage, steam rising off the audience. And we actually, I think we named, we named the photograph Life at the Top with Def Leppard 1986. 
And it really was, it just summed up the way things were going for us. It was, um, we making the best of a bad situation with the awful weather and halfway through this album. But those gigs were fantastic because the German audiences had a lot of Americans in there because of the fact that there's, there was a lot of army folk and, and, and based in Germany. And the Pyromania album would be massive in America. So there was the German fans and the American fans all mingled together, making a lot of noise. And it just gave us our confidence. And when we went back in to start recording Hysteria again after those shows, we were like 10 feet tall. We were full of beans because we felt good. You know, we've got a great reaction from the crowds. And it just gave us some energy to go back and finish this album. And had we not done those shows, who knows what that album would have turned out like. Okay, well, if you're a Def Leppard fan, I would imagine there's always a need to listen to some new music because as much as it's great to have this, you know, massive back catalogue of music, new music is what keeps a band alive. So we want to share that with our fans. Um, why do they want to listen to it? Well, I believe that this is a career defining album for a band that's been around now for 45 years. To make an album that's this strong, I believe, um, at this part of our career is is actually quite an achievement you know there's i i've been comparing the situation not the albums but i've been comparing the situation with diamond star halos for def leppard i think is capable of being what hotel california was for the eagles or rumors was for fleetwood mac and what i mean by that is what came before was fine there was nothing wrong with it in fact the Eagles greatest hits, which was their previous album to Hotel California, is one of the biggest selling records of all time. It speaks for itself. And the Fleetwood Mac scenario of the Peter Green years, the Jeremy Spence years, it was all brilliant stuff. But then they put out rumors and Eagles put out Hotel California and it was a quantum leap. I believe that this album is a quantum leap. It's not a rehash of Pyromania or Hysteria or any of our albums. It's got all the flavors that Def Leppard have had in the past, but it's got some new explorations that we've never done that I think our audience are ready for this journey because it's 35 years since Hysteria was released. It's 39 since Pyromania came out and our audience are also older like we are. So I think they're ready to hear something a little different, you know. Like I said, he's still got plenty of Def Leppard stuff. Give me a kiss at rocks, SOS Emergency, fire it up, kick. They're all classic Def Leppard. But there's some stuff that just, like our hero's queen, it just goes off on tangents that are a little different to the stuff that they've done in the past. This is Joe from Def Leppard. Thanks for listening. And see you on the road in 2023. Rockland Radio. Bester Rock and Pop.